from a, a simple x-rays into you've seen the sort of x-rays you can do for body scanners but now we've got 3d x-rays going down to the nanoscale the problem is these sort of uh, equipments are very expensive in uk money it could be a million pounds which is a lot of money so it means that most universities or research laboratories can't afford some of this equipment so we have to share it which is fine and by sharing it we have a schedule and these sort of equipment will be in use if the demand is uh, 24 hours a day which is making the best use of the equipment because as it develops in a couple of years this sort of equipment will become obsolete and new techniques will be developed and um, to get the most accurate results we need to stay up to date now this might not even be in the same country some of my collaborators you'll see uh, in the second lecture move around the globe to use some of these high powered x-ray type equipment for analysis of materials in my own lab we use ultrasound a lot of people will be aware of ultrasound used in medical aspects you can see inside a human body at certain frequencies at other frequencies it can see inside electronics such as inside silicon chips so the accuracy of ultrasound isn't as good normally as x-ray nowadays but we can still use it effectively and i'm going to show you in the second part of this talk how we've used ultrasound with x-ray uh, to do a failure analysis a new emerging method which i've been looking at with some uh, students at my own university is called time domain reflectometry tdr and it's an emerging method as circuits get smaller and time domain reflectometry really just sends a pulse out and measures the reflection coming back so it's working more or less at the speed of light sending and receiving pulses and it used to be used for measuring say breaks in cables over long distances but as things have speeded up and electronics have speeded up we can now start to implement time domain reflectometry at the circuit level and this is an exciting development for me as an electronic engineer because we can try and make circuits that can test uh, circuits we need to test using this technique. So we're just going to look at the measurement techniques for validation testing, how to do failure analysis, and at the end, we'll go on to a case study. So initially, we did mention it uh, in one of the previous lectures, we can use a simulation computers are everywhere and nowadays a laptop computer or a personal computer are very powerful so what used to be done on the mainframe such as a finite element simulation can now be done on lower cost computers the softwares are very advanced nowadays probably all this sort of software because it's so advanced it can take a long time to learn how to use it but if you put the effort in learn how to do the finite element simulation you can very quickly estimate the effects or the effects of different conditions on a circuit so you can estimate fault conditions a lot quicker than actually building a chip and testing it physically so quite often people do simulation as they go towards designing a new piece of apparatus or a new chip or a new circuit but a simulation is only as good as the data set used so data regarding the material sets and the material properties need to be accurate for a simulation to be accurate at the end of the day it's only a good estimate in the first stage of development but with experience it can be a good estimate that helps with the rest of the design process and any test process so it may point out weak points in the system so it can inform how we're going to test the test regime or the test strategy and the results from the simulation can be used to improve future predictions and there's a new uh, field coming out called prognostics so we do a small amount of simulation or testing and the prognostics will help us predict what will probably happen in the future so when it comes from a laboratory scale to industrial scale a lot of the big companies such as automotive suppliers 
uh, some aerospace suppliers, uh, space equipment. We need expensive equipment to actually test electronics before you maybe send it out into the field. If you're making a satellite, for example, you send it out into space, and it costs a lot of money to make the satellite and launch it into space. If it doesn't work, it's uh, you can't really go out and fix it. So you got to train the staff on how to do the validation, and it needs money. But the validation takes a lot of time, and the machine time, which is the test equipment, is very expensive, and staff time is expensive. <coughs> so if these tests take up to a year, you can think about how much it would cost to employ some staff for a year and use an expensive machine for a year, which has its own cost. Um, it becomes astronomical. So, usually you go to a specialist centre and we'll have temperature testing in some uh, temperature cycling, but which is very different from, say, EMC testing. So we'll have a specialist centre for validation testing and maybe go to a specialist EMC test centre to do the electromagnetic compatibility testing. And these centres exist. And if you're doing the validation and it's an industrial product, you need to schedule it in for design time. If it takes six months to design a product, it may take another six months to one year to test it before it's ready to go out into the market and be reliable. So we'll quickly just want to show you some of the TICE equipment because you probably haven't seen it. Uh, a thermal cycling chamber. This is a relatively large one. And you can also apply humidity in some of these types of chambers. So you can do temperature, humidity individually or together. So inside the window there, you've got a, a chamber. You can hang in your circuit board of the full system you want to test. And this is uh, size wise, these can be as high as a human being, down to what we call a small pizza oven like a small domestic oven. So the larger tits, the space in here is the space, the test area. And down below we've got control and heating and cooling gear. And maybe even externally we may have some heating and cooling gear because inside this chamber, we're going to program it on a keypad or via a laptop to cool down the chamber to be as low as maybe minus 60 degrees C. And then we keep it cold for, say, 15 minutes to 30 minutes, depending on the cycle. Then we, as quickly as we, the chamber will allow, ramp it up from minus 60 to, say, plus 130 or plus 150 degrees C, so quite hot. And that can take a good few minutes to even half an hour, depending on the system, to uh, increase the temperature. Then we hold it at a high temperature for a period, maybe again 15 minutes to 30 minutes typically, and then we repeat, we cycle back down, cool it down to minus 60. So we do this maybe a thousand times. So if it's one hour per cycle, you can qu quickly see that's a thousand cycles is a thousand hours already. And that's just a maybe an introductory test. So these tests can take four, five or six months. So what we might do is we might look at the, uh, we monitor the electronics in the chamber. We can uh, power it up. If you've got the right to test gear, bring out connections, monitor if the, it's an active device, if it's still uh, running correctly, any changes in the device, and uh, hopefully it will pass. And then it can go into the field. If it fails, we'll then investigate why it failed. So again, these quite power hungry devices, you're heating and cooling. So it's not the sort of thing most people would have in a design lab. You'd probably go to a specialist test center to do the thermal cycling. The second thing you may want to do is shake the device. And I've done all these things in my own research. But again, to buy a shaker, this is a, like a big electrical motor got coils and magnets in here, and on the end, you have a plunger normally coming out. On the plunger, you'll, you'll attach a, a metal uh, 
platform. On that platform, you will fix your circuit you want to test. So this thing can shake at so many times gravity, say 10 G, some maybe go even higher. So we've shaken the component to try and simulate what happened in real life. So you have a vibration profile, and depending on the use, if it's a uh, domestic use or going in a, a train or a car, an automobile, we'll have different profiles for the shaking. So these things are very noisy. You can imagine this is shaking. You typically cycle it from naught hertz up to one or two kilohertz. So because you put a lot of power into here to get the shaking, um, and you're changing it, it's got multi frequencies, it, it's very noisy. So, most of the places I've seen these larger shakers in use, and the size of this from top to bottom might be uh, a couple of meters. So, it's quite a large motor or shaker, it's like a sort of motor really. The, you usually have to run this inside a enclosure that's got acoustic uh, or soundproofing baffles on it and when you go in when it's running you have to really do put on a headset because it will affect your hearing quite badly. So we're shaking again could take uh, a few weeks to do the shaking test so you may shake it for a day take the equipment off have a look at it see how it's doing under the microscope <clears throat> and put it back onto the shaker. So again, this is particularly important, I would say, for vehicles, anything that's traveling. So cars, aeroplanes, satellites, rockets, anything like this, you need to try and test and see how it responds to vibration. So what I've got in my own lab, this is an acoustic microscope, a company called Sonoscan. And what we do here is we have a water bath, and again, this water bath is about uh, one meter square. So this is an operator's terminal, so you can see we, you sit underneath the terminal. And we have uh, signals on the screen and another signal of the chip in the water. So there's a scan head there which goes backwards and forwards. The resolution of a scan head is in terms of uh, about one micron. But the resolution of ultrasound is in tens of micron and that will depend on the frequency of the transducer. Typically, the transducer frequency will go from about 10 hertz up to about 400, sorry, 10 megahertz up to about 400 megahertz, although some more refined ones now are in the gigahertz region, but it's quite difficult to get them to work. So there's a picture taken when we first got this uh, system. It took a lot of fundraising to get this. To buy this system is about 100, 200 or $300,000, depending on which version you might want to get. So to get one in our own laboratory, and uh, we can use it every day for our testing, it's a viable tool to have. And you can see there with some uh, screens as we're doing some scanning. And this is the chip I talked about the other day which is the 109 pin chip when we started to do scans on this. So We also went to do some 3D x-rays at the centre close to Liverpool in Manchester. And this is a similar type of uh, product. And these really do go to micro and nanoscale imaging. So you can see inside objects uh, materials such as solder materials, chips, down to the micro and nanoscale. But these type of equipment so are very expensive because they're very complicated to design and to make. And the problem is as you go down towards nanoscale, you can only look at a smaller and smaller object because you've only got such an area you can scan with the x-rays. If you want to scan a large object, say a full circuit board, you can probably only do it at micro scale. If you want to go down to a, a small chip, or a component level, you can probably go down more towards nanoscale. So you've got to decide what you want to look at. And you need to book into these centers and they're very costly. You can book in on a, a day rate. Thing that's been in universities and 
Failure analysis type labs for years is a scanning electron microscope. It's quite old technology now, but I'm sure we're still improving it over time. So for this one, basically it's the type of uh, high resolution microscope. And according to when I looked into it last couple of years ago, the resolution is about one and a half nanometers in one mode and three nanometers in another mode. So the trouble again with this type of uh, device is you can only put a small sample into the chamber. So you get in high resolution over a small area. So if we're trying to do <coughs> non-destructive testing of a circuit board that might be four centimeters square for quite a big size board, we can't physically put it inside here to do the scanning. We can only cut it, which then becomes destructive. We can cut it if it fails and start to look at the failures in here, which is what we do. We section the solder joints after failure and we'll have a look at the properties using this SEM. So, non-destructive testing, you can think about it for failure analysis, which one of these techniques, for electronic circuit board or chip, is really non-destructive. We've got the SEM we just looked at, X-ray, we've got acoustic or this ultrasound imaging, optical imaging. So optical imaging is usually non-destructive, it's just like a microscope, but again, we can only see the visible to the human eye type things. We can't look inside solder joints and we can't look underneath chips very easily. Then there's hybrids, uh, laser ultrasonics, combining uh, optics and ultrasonics in an emerging field where you might uh, shine a laser or pulse a laser on a chip and then you'll measure the ultrasound coming off and you can get various hybrid techniques like this. You can measure the resistance. Quite often we've made daisy chains, which means you connected all the pins of the circuit board together in a ring. And as we're going through these tests, we'll measure the difference in resistance as the uh, circuit might degrade. But these measurements are quite difficult. The change in resistance is very small. And what tends to happen is it just starts to change slightly as I say, a solar joint or something's going to break and very quickly it's going along nicely with virtually no resistance and when it breaks it's open circuit. So the trick is to try and detect the resistance early, which because it's a small change is quite difficult. When we do our acoustic or ultrasound imaging, we can probably detect the change a bit early because we're looking for cracks and the cracks will affect the resistance, but it's easy to see a crack, I think, than some of the resistance changes I've seen. Then when you think coming in TDR, or you send a pulse out, measure its reflectance back. Again, it's it's moving quite fast. We said the other day that electronics tends to be moving about one nanosecond to do about 30 centimeters. So you send a pulse out, so you need very high speed detection circuitry. And again, for TDR, I think asynchronous circuitry has got a big future. You're not waiting for any clock, so you send a pulse out, it reflects back, you can trigger an asynchronous circuit, and by repeatedly sending out uh, pulses, you can work out where the reflection is. Reflection is usually higher from a break in the circuit, where you get a cracking, for example, or a break in the track. So it should be very good in the future for measuring failure. So now I'm going to talk about a case study, how we came up with one idea, mainly using our ultrasound to look at flip chips. So I'll just come out of this presentation and hopefully go into the next one. I assume you can see this. If not, you'll have to shout. Can you see this one? Maybe not. I'll just I'll just try again. Okay, you should be able to see this. Oh, 
Okay, hopefully you can see this. If you can't see this, we can I expect someone to shout. So here's a project I want to talk just quickly about is how we looked at how cracks can propagate in solder joints using acoustic microimaging, which is a type of ultrasound analysis. So this is done in my own research group at the General Engineering Research Institute at uh, Liverpool John Moore University. Uh, myself and a colleague, Dr. Zhang, supervised the student, which was Dr. Li, who now works for Intel in Malaysia. So he's done very well out of research. So the idea was how, how we're going to model some work we've done previously to try and understand a bit more about how the acoustic uh, images were produced from the solder joints. So the main part of this was the finite element modeling, which was new to us. And in fact, it took the students a long time to teach himself how to do this. Then we got some nice results and I'm going to go through them and some brief findings. So in our own work, we've worked a lot with automotive companies. So we want to do non-destructive testing. We want to test a product from when it arrives in our laboratory to failure without either cutting it or having to destroy the circuit before it, its normal lifetime is complete. So in other words, we have one circuit board. We can look at the same circuit board for six months to a year and monitor how it might degrade. So what's wrong with acoustic microscopy? Well, it's sensitive to air gaps. So anything with an air gap in such as delamination or a crack where things will separate, we have an air gap and acoustic or ultrasound signals reflect very nicely from the crack. So we can start to detect cracking very early. So we think we can detect it at sub-micron level. Okay. Okay. Hello, I've been material and interconnect, interconnects. So how do you characterize the techniques? Well, we've got limitations due to the spot size, focal depth, focal length, and frequency of all these types of uh, scans. So let's look at the specimen. We've got a, a, a X-ray and an acoustic image of an unreflowed solder bump. What this means is when we've heated up the circuit, the solder hasn't melted and it has to melt and re-solidify to form a joint. So you can see the shape of a solder joint here is a bit like the old matchstick heads. So these are the shapes we expect to see, more rounded shapes, more oval shapes. And you can see on the image on the other side, it's a bit noisy, but generally there's a white part in the centre because these joints will be slightly curved with a flat uh, top where we meet the uh, chip. And on the side here, these look a different shape, they're slightly twisted. And this one here looks completely twisted compared to the joints up here. So these at the top are actually good solder joints. Some of these down on the side, the temperature is not being correct when we did the soldering, the reflow, we call it. So you can see this one was lit up here as a big air gap. You can see it looks like it's not melted at all. That's the original solder ball, which is a spherical shape, and it hasn't melted at all. When it melts, it will get squashed down into a sort of squashed sphere. So this one hasn't melted. So you can see that very easily with AMI, with the ultrasound. And another one down here is only partially melted. You can see this has got a big air gap. So using this sort of finding, we're using our ultrasound machine to do the scans to see how these cracks will develop from the good joints. But when the good joints actually crack, they'll end up looking brighter like the poor joints here. So in our own work, we used a 109 pin flip chip. So it's a silicon chip, so silicon is visible to the outside world, shiny silicon, connections are on the board there, and you've got two main rows of chips, an outer row and an inner row. 
then three other joints further into the circuit, in total 109 joints. Um, you can see a normal joint will have a bright circle and then a darker ring around it, a bit like a sort of donut, if you know what a donut is. So what happens around the edges, you get some edge effect due to ultrasound being bent by the edge of the silicon. So the chips on the periphery, it's quite difficult to get these circular images because you're getting distortion, which we have to account for in our processing. So when we've got a good joint, now just thinking about this joint here, this is what we call a, a good joint away from any edge effect to do with the chip. We have edge effects due to the ultrasound hitting the solder ball itself. So we had a lot of trouble thinking about why this might be. So if the chips sit... Hello? Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, maybe you see the slides you are explaining. You can't see the slide? Uh, in the screen, it's just the first space of your slides is visible now. Okay, let me try again. Sorry. Thank you for letting me know. Sorry about that. Can you see it now? Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, let's carry on. Let me just go back then. So you didn't see this one? Yeah, yes, sir. I, we, we, yes. Okay, let's just go for this one again in case you missed it, because this is important. So on the left, you've got an X-ray image of a circuit board with solder joints. On the right, we've got an acoustic image, or we call it acoustic micro image. So on X-ray, you can see the good joints when the solder has melted. When it's been manufactured, it's got like a match head shape on it, if you know what a match head is. So it's a sort of an elongated uh, circle. The, the solder joint starts off as a sphere. So in the X-ray, you can see, or it's quite difficult to see unless you really know what you're looking for. This solder joint hasn't melted. So on the ultrasound, it lights up very brightly. So that means because it hasn't melted, there's a big air gap between the solder joint and the circuit. Whereas on these joints at the top, when the solder joint melts, the ball will get flattened down. So you've got uh, a con more continuous connection between the solder and the chip. Okay, so what we're looking for is on a good solder joint, which is this one, we have this sort of donut shape. We have a ring around a fairly bright middle, which is due to the reflection due to this flattening as we go from the silicon material of the chip to the solder material, which in this case is tin and lead. So what did we do? Uh, we, we wondered why did we get this donut shape? So it took a lot of uh, thinking and we got the chip here, the silicon chips on the top and the solder ball, because the solder ball is connected flat, but on the edges it's slightly curved. So anything uh, in terms of a wave, a light wave, or ultrasound wave, when it hits a curve, it's reflected or scattered in all different directions. So this means you get a loss of information coming back. So this is why we have this sort of darkening here. So we thought, can we get some information from this region, which isn't normally considered by too many people, about the integrity of the solder joint? So the study was using ANSYS, finite element software, which is quite complicated software. I'm going to do a 2D cross-section acoustic simulation and the pro proposed characterization methodology, which is what the PhD student, Dr. Lee, did. And then we verified the, the uh, results experimentally. So it's not just pure simulation, it had a real output. So things about finite elements are, you make up a mesh, contain the structural properties. And again, I'm not an expert in finite element, but uh, however big the mesh is, will determine how long the simulation time is, but also the accuracy. So you come up with some matrices, and you've got different elements per wavelength. And we usually have five elements per wavelength for draft simulation to speed it up, and maybe go to 20 for more detailed simulations. So it works on uh, solving equations. So you've got to solve this propagation equation where the speed of sound is the ultrasound. 
and we've got the pressure here, and we've got the acceleration here. So we just want to look at the findings rather than the detail about what we actually did. So initially we've got a transducer, so it's a focused ultrasound transducer, so it's drawn like this to focus the beam down onto the chip. Luckily, ultrasound passes through the water with virtually no attenuation. When it passes through the chip, which in this case is a silicon chip, and the inter interfaces we're interested in is around the solder joint, uh, where it's connected to the chip and also where it's connected to the board, because these are the regions where failures most likely take place. So we're using a 230 megahertz transducer, and the focal length of this one is 9,500 micrometers. So because we have to go through the water to get to the chip, we have to effectively put the water into a finer element model. And that means we've got then got 120 million elements, which when we try to run it, uh, it would have taken a very long time. So comp computational load is impractical. So we had to find a different way of applying the signal to the chip. So the student came up with the idea of a virtual transducer. So instead of having a long distance between a transducer through the water to the silicon, which is null, it moved it closer, but had the same effect. So we can apply the signals from this virtual transducer now to the chip. We went into the chip uh, interface in more detail. We got a silicon die here. Then normally under chips and on circuit boards, we got what we call UBM, which is the under bump metallization. So this is usually uh, like a sandwich, a multi-layer structure, which in this case we've got aluminium, nickel and copper in a layer. And then after that, we can we can uh, solder the bump onto this under bump metallization. As we'll see in the talk, uh, the next talk, rather than connect straight into the die, this makes a better connection. And that's a bit like a materials buffer between the silicon and the solder. Um, so here's this virtual transducer. So instead of having to go through the water, it's looking at it lower down with a micro cord and speed the whole thing up. So again, most people who have done simulation will know if things are uh, symmetrical, you can save a lot of time. So we're assuming this joint is symmetrical about the center. So then we can only do half a simulation. But if you do half a simulation, reflect it back over to make the full picture. So we don't simulate the left-hand side of a bump. We're only doing the right-hand side. And the way we set up the simulation is going to iterate from the center of a bump, half a micron or 500 nanometers at a time, take the measurements as we go through this uh, looking at the top with the ultrasound penetrating the top of this under bump metallization, seeing the signals as we go to this uh, edge, the solder ball, and then away from the solder ball. So we start the scan at 0 microns in the center, and we finish at 70 microns, because the width of this solder ball is 140 microns, and the height of the solder ball is normally about 100 microns once it's soldered. We deal with quite small objects, so in ultrasound, what we do is we send what we call an A scan down, and this comes from the top, and we have a pulse, which in this case we call the main bang, and it's a designed by inside the apparatus. This flows down the water, it touches the different layers, and you can see we're getting different reflections back. So once you've got the A scan, you can then add all the A scans together. This is what we call a B scan, which is really a picture looking through the different layers. So it's quite useful to analyze what's going on inside a layer. So this is simulated, and we can get a similar sort of pictures from an actual scanning machine. So the student came up with a new idea called the C line. So as he gated out the area of interest, which you can do on the system and on his software as well, you can see that. As the reflection from the ultrasound starts to get close to the edge, it starts to drop off, which is the dark ring we see on the diagrams. Then as it goes away, it starts to come up. So we thought, well, is this of any interest to do with failure analysis? 
So extend a loop further, and once you've got this uh, dip, you then produced his own type of C scan, where the C scan is a normal planar scan through uh, the chip where we gate out, say, the A scan, we gate out the A scan and set this layer here, and we can see anything that's happening here. So it's a bit complicated with different types of scan, but you should be able to see that this simulated bright and dark pulse is similar to what happens in reality here, if we just ignore the outer ring for now. So the theory is that as the acoustic energy is getting close to the edge, it's scattered due to the curve of the edge. It's also affected by the underbump metallization. We found out later if you remove the underbump metallization, because it's got a square edge, uh, this system doesn't have the same effect. It's a lot smoother. So here's a Example of what happens when we just about get to the edge here. So you can see as an ultrasound pulse coming from the top, the main pulse hits this uh, unbuilt metallization, and then it starts to disperse. And there's a side lobe here, which for some reason just disappears. We expected that side lobe to keep going down the edge. So in terms of a scale, red is obviously the main uh, power in the signal, as the colours go down orange, yellow, green and blue is less power, so it's, the pulse is hitting and it's being dispersed. So how does it look in reality? In reality, using the same 230 hertz focus transducer on our sonar scan machine, the initial A scan on this joint here, when we take the gate at the solder joint to chip interface, we get this signal here, which again is like the fairly bright center and a dark ring. And at the die to bump interface, it's a similar picture. After 40 thermal cycles, which is when the chip in this case is starting to fail. So we've cycled it in our chamber. You can see on these pictures, which is the corner of the chip, this chip's got 109 joints, but only a few are showing here for accuracy. So when you look at the one at 40, you can see it's getting a bit brighter. And the same for this one. So as it gets brighter, the central area expands and the area goes up, the intensity goes up. And this is due to a crack forming between the solder joints and the chip. So. The idea was, how can we try to detect the crack when it's just starting? If we've got a small crack here, 25 microns, between the airway the underbump metallization meets the uh, solder, and then when we've got a crack at 75 microns, can we detect how it might propagate? Because usually the crack will start um, just under the underbump metallization due to stresses of the thing flexing. It usually will start to be visible on the outside of a solder. So this is a, what might happen in reality. And the crack tends to form just under uh, under bulk metallization, not exactly on it, because we have something we'll look at later today. Intermetallic compounds are formed, which is a brittle region of a solder. And this extends just underneath the UBM. And normally the crack will propagate along this line. And it's not a straight line, it tends to these will be slightly curved in my experience. So again, it's got a simulated B scan there. So these are looking about what's going on. These are ultrasounds, waves added together. You can see, or maybe you can't see what's flowing there. So from this, we get results where we get this dip again, which we're proposing is due to the edge Effect where the ultrasound image intensity did it uh, under bump edge. We have different crack sizes. This we have to bring one to see. Remember the 12 crack, we get blue, the 
Then we do 30 micron crack with the change, the dips come up. 35 in purple, 47.5 in green, 57 in this dark colour, and 72.5, which is a center of the chip. In this is, as we're moving through the uh, chip and the crack, so instead we get, we can use this difference to do analysis. So in reality, if we do uh, the C scan, which is the planar scan, our number of thermal cycles, a good joint starts to look like this. A dull grey centre with a dark outer ring. After eight cycles, it's changed slightly with a slight amount of micro cracking. After 16 cycles, maybe the crack forming on the left side. 24 cycles, and so with a, a micro crack or micro cracks around the joint. Then at 32 cycles, we know then that the joint has failed. So this is as bright as the joint will get until it falls off the circuit board. Because once all the joints break, of course, the chip falls off the circuit board, so you can't do any of these measurements because we're measuring the crack. When the chip falls off, there's no crack left. So then we looked at how you might look at uh, the shape of a C-line plot. And as you do along the axes, how accurate is it? So there's a central brighter point with a darker outer ring. And in the X and Y direction, the simulation is quite accurate to predict what might happen. So when you extract these plots from the solder joints, it's uh, not so clear. But you can still see at north cycles you've got the blue one, at tape cycles you've got the green one, at 32 cycles when it's failed you've got the purple one. You can still see with a jump in the shape and the image intensity. So you can use this jump of a minimum to work out what's happening in the chip. Then you try to align the plots and you can see it more clearly. So north cycles is a healthy solder joint. As you go up here, 32 cycles is starting to break. And you can see there's a definite progression. Image magnitude is changing as the crack propagates. Then it looked at the dip in this waveform against the number of cycles and should be able to see thermal cycles from 0 to 32 equivalent there. You can see as this measure goes up, the simulated data is going up as well. So it's managed to simulate what was happening in real life and come up with a way to quickly assess what might happen for any new product before we build it. And then the capex, which is the size of a cap. Again, in reality, the number of thermal cycles up to 32. In reality, it's going up. And on the simulation, it's a bit more noisy, but the general trend is up. So that's not a perfect result, but with simulation, you can't get it. And in practical stuff. This isn't a perfect result either. So in conclusion, when you've got spherical solder balls and we're looking at it with ultrasound, which is our measurement tool, we can get this edge effect phenomena, which can affect results. So to get around this, the student came with a single line plot and he got his own novel method, which he published to measure the status of a joint. And this is based on measures he's come up with, looking at the cap and the dip in these figures. And he can characterize the crack propagation. So the good thing about this is with ultrasound, we can't measure the actual crack size. We just measure the development of a crack. But it's non-destructive. And the experimental results confirm that the new theory was correct. I want to finish this presentation and just go, go back to the tutorial briefly. Okay, so I just want to stop sharing for a minute and go back to the tutorial.
OK, I hope you can see this one. If you can't see this, let me know. We've got a few minutes left. So yesterday we were talking about a four bit serial signature analyzer. I just want to review one of the outputs as I did some more results last night for you. So if you've got a four bit serial signature analyzer, we're assuming that the input coming in is eight bits, not one, one, not one, not not one is a good signature coming, a good, uh, good input from the circuit of the test, which is the output from the circuit, but it's the input to the signature analyzer. And this should produce this signature 1001. All these other ones here should masquerade. Sorry, all these ones down here are incorrect signatures. If you look at them bit by bit, they don't match up to the correct output. None of these outputs here are not 1101001. So all these should give a different signature to this one, which we sometimes call the golden signature. Now I remember, I gave you outputs. So yesterday I did this, and I'm going to do the golden signature, which I missed. I did this one because it gives the correct signature. So you see that this one gives the same signature as the correct set of outputs, but it's aliased. The error is not detected. The next three give a different signature. So the error is detected. Then the final one again gives what looks like the correct signature, but the sequence isn't the same as this, so the error is not detected. So just to go through it very quickly, you got the PRBS generator. Remember, we've got uh, feedback from my way, Q4 and Q1. We now add in another exclusive OR gate to do the uh, signature analysis. So when we do the correct signature, it's naught one one naught one naught naught one coming in. Remember how we did it yesterday. So we take the exclusive all between QA and QD. Then we take the exclusive all of that output with X. So doing the first one it's zero because we initialized to zero. The next X coming in is one. So QA and QD are naught gives an exclusive all naught. That exclusive all if one gives a one, that one goes in. It starts to propagate. This is a feedback shift radius. So it's moving things on every clock cycle. And the final signature coming out is one zero zero one, which is what some people call the golden signature. Or the golden golden output gives the correct signature. So when we look at the first example, this is number one. This is the earliest signature. Now the Input is x equal naught, 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 one, one, naught, one. Again, when you run through the speech analysis, we clock the system through. When we clocked it through, the signature is still one, zero, zero, one. This is the correct signature, but it's the incorrect sequence, so we call this an alias signature. So that's the end of the tutorial, so I want to come out now. And we can see if there's any questions before we finish. Let me just stop sharing. Hello, because I want to give time for you to have a rest before you can look forward to the talk by my friend, the former director of MNNIT. OK, Sonia, any questions? Some of you there? Any, anyway, I suggest we, if some is there, she may come yes, on. Sir, I'm oh, she's there. I'm just suggesting maybe we should have a short break before. Uh, Professor Tripathi comes on. Hello. Hello, yes. Are you there? Yes, uh, thank you so much, sir. And uh, we would be continuing with the lecture uh, in the third lecture uh, you would be taking. So right now, Professor Tripathi would be taking the continuing with the lecture. So uh, he would be joining soon with us.
Do, is it worth having a five minute break between lectures? Yeah, we can have a five minute break till the time uh, uh, Professor Rajiv sir is uh, joining with us. So we can have a break till that time. Yeah, I think it's good to give people a break just to just for five minutes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can have that. OK, so I'll, I'll be online, but I'll see you in an hour for the next lecture. OK, OK, sir. OK. See you then. So I hope I'm audible to you. Yes, sir, you are audible, sir. Okay. Professor Rajiv Pipati, sir, has already joined. Uh, so yes. he is going to engage problems from the user ID, Vikas uh, user ID, OK? So okay, participants, sir, okay. Uh, you know, you, you please introduce him after one minute, OK? So once he is visible on the screen, you introduce okay, him. Sir, okay. okay, sir. Okay. okay. Also, take care of uh, okay, you know, uh, making the full screen that uh, uh, no, hi highlight the uh, user ID. Uh, Vikas's okay, user sir. ID need make, to be highlighted. I will make him Lime on the light. spotlight, sir. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's, that's
Am I visible and audible? All okay, of you? Yes, sir. You are visible and audible. Pass the disconnect card. Discuss. Right. So, uh, visible, audible, both. Good. So, I have changed the mode of uh, my presentation from uh, PowerPoint to maybe conventional chalk and board. And uh, that's why it's like a different arrangement has been made. You have already heard a highway and, uh, on a number of topics of electronics that you design and uh, all these uh, they are to be fabricated at uh, nano level with a lot of complexities and uh, then when we talk about the uh, interconnection of all these circuits where the real problem comes and that too at the micro level or at nano level so i was trying to focus on uh, in my previous discussion i was trying to focus on uh, how to provide the interconnection between the different kinds of circuits which are uh, inbuilt and uh, the big complex circuits i have already Describe some of the issues, some of the challenges in uh, having a large complex CMOS, particularly which are popular today, and uh, the similar kind of thing uh, at maybe in a different dimension will be in the nano circuits as, as well. Now, uh, while going to our uh, discussion, what we did last time when we interacted, that is uh, in terms of uh, routing, in terms of providing the connectivity. As I said, that this routing phenomena and connecting connectivity phenomena uh, from uh, one circuit to another circuit, that is similar to any other kind of routing with slight modifications. And in routing, as you know, that one of the important objective of any such kind of routing, which provides the physical geographical connectivity. And here I said earlier that uh, since we are putting on the same board, so maybe geographical word can be removed, but the overall objective remains same that uh, with the minimum time, the information, data, or signal that needs to be uh, that that is supposed to reach to the destination are supposed to reach in the other part or another segment of the circuit, which is uh, designed in isolation. Now, the fastest communication network architecture which is normally used in case of uh, your uh, this kind of circuit is multi-stage interconnection networks and uh, for very fast effective and efficient processor to memory module communication these multi state of the connection networks they were used and they are being used in almost all the parallel processing part also for providing the connectivity same multi-state interconnection networks are used now why to go for multi-state instead of single state in, in case of single stage, just for example, if you just check if it is coming or not. In one very basic, simple example of 
a two by two switching element. This is your normal switching element. Now from here, you have two inputs. One first input is here, second input is here. First output is here, second output is here. Anything which is re reaching here at one, this can go either like this or connected like this. Similarly, from input two, Either it can go like this or it can go like this. This is the normal crossbar switch. And if a single state switching is to be provided, you need to have, if these are the number of cross points, <clears throat> with the single state switching, for any n by n network, the number of cross points required will be of the order of n square. Now, more number of cross points, more complexity. And as you increase the complexity, the system reliability goes down. And the concept from traffic engineering, now that concept is equally applicable for this providing this kind of interconnection as well. Okay. That's right. Sorry. So the as far as the traffic part of the engineering that is concerned, it says that even at the highest connectivity level, if we are providing this kind of completely non-blocking architecture, now what is blocking? Blocking is that at the same time, and any two inputs, they are accessing the same link or the same node. Definitely, the signal is going to be blocked and you are likely to lose the connectivity. So that is what the blocking is. So the blocking basically is in terms of link level blocking or the node level blocking. When simultaneously, two inputs are trying to connect with the uh, through the same link or the same node. Now, with this, the problem is that we can go for completely blocking kind of a structure instead of having non-blocking architecture if we go for blocking architecture, the blocking architecture here, non-blocking architecture, that was switching. Single state switching. Instead of single state switching, 
if we go for multi stage switching we can reduce these two things we can reduce the number of blocks thereby we can reduce the complexity as well as we can increase the reliability now multi stage so the question is that how many stages this is the main issue to be taken care of in general if we are having similar kind of network when i say similar kind of network meaning thereby the number of inputs are equal to number of outputs and by n network we are going to realize and we need to identify what type of switching elements we are going to use for a basic understanding i'll go by the another architecture but for the basic understanding normally we talk about basic switching element as 2 by 2 switching element as i have shown here with a single switching element of 2 by 2 the number of stages how many stages that will depend upon that can be calculated with number of switching stages if we are using 2 by 2 this will be log 2 sorry log n base 2 and what will be the number of switching state elements switching elements for the stage this will be n by 2 if we are using again 2 by 2 switching element now this will be more clear if we take an example of a very simple example i'll take if we talk about 8 by 8 network with 2 by 2 switching elements so what will be the number of switching elements okay let us talk about number of switching stages so as per this formula what you have log 2 eight which will come out to be three stages and how many number of switching elements for the stage that will be n by 2 as i said if we are realizing with 2 by 2 so this will be your 
8 by 2, that is 4. Now, with this information available, there are four switching stages, switching elements. Each stage. Three stages are there. So, we will have three stages. Two by two, so two input in each switching element, two outputs, now the basic structure is here, and if you give address to different ports in binary form, this will be your 000, 000, 000, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. Is it correct? This is with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Similarly, here. Okay. Now, the problem is of connectivity. How these stages are connected? At many places, you will find different types of mathematical things for providing the connectivity. I'll tell you. One of the very basic and simple way by which you have to connect. In this case, forget about last stage. You have to take this connectivity first. From first stage to second stage. And then from second stage to third stage. There are two links which are coming out. One you can designate as the upper link, another you can designate as it as a lower link. Second stage, Adhakari. Put it half like this. So all the upper links are connected to first half. Is it clear? And similarly, all the lower links are connected to second half. Now, here you divided it by half at this stage. Take it like this. Again, divide it by half. And all the upper links will be connected by first half. All the lower links will be connected by second half. Similarly, you have to do in this block. This completes your connectivity. Now, 
these two things that will remain same for any kind of multi-state interconnection networks. The difference will be only in terms of connectivity. Various groups, various people, they have proposed the different types of connectivity and accordingly they have named that corresponding multi-state interconnection networks with different names. Now, how the routing takes place Routing takes place, the routing strategy, or you can say the connectivity, focus, focus, is it visible to everyone? Clearly visible, rather. Yes, sir. Okay. I just wanted to show it by doing. Otherwise, if you are putting these things on slides, that will not be very much clear to you. Now, if we talk about the connectivity, this is basically a designation address based. Routing. Now, what does it mean? From any input, if you have to go to any output, say the destination address is uh, take anyone, say for example, 0, 1, 1. Any input, say for example, here. There are three bits, three stages. Every bit will define the connectivity of that state. This is your zero, this is one for every switching element. So take any input, first bit is zero, connect it to zero, reach here. Second bit is one, connect it to one. Third bit is one, this will be connected like this. And you have finally reached to the destination. Likewise, you can take any output port, put it in any of these input port, and the connectivity or routing will be like this only. Just you need to remember only one thing, that this, this is a crossbar switch. Two ways are possible. This is zero, this is one. If it is zero, connect it to zero. If it is one, connect it to one. Take any port, input port, take any output port, and this will be true. Now, if I'm going for, say for example, 16 by 16, you can do the same operation. With the 16 by 16, 2 by 2 switching element, the number of stages will be more, number of stages will be 8, 16 divided by 2, 
sorry, number of switching elements for this stage will be 8. And the number of switching stages will be from here, replace 8 by 16. How many you will get? 4. And you start the connectivity like that only, unless, uh, sorry, until you reach there with single switching element. And that you will reach at the destination. So you take any number, you can do this exercise, you can check, and as you go on increasing this number, number of bits will keep on increasing in terms of addressing, and these number of bits will be equivalent to the number of stages which you will be getting. Now, this is one of the simplest example of a multi-stage interconnection network. If you have to put it at nano level, from the design point of view, these are the nanoparticles, and this is a nano wire which is connecting these particles, and each of these particles are capable of uh, taking a routing decision, and accordingly the different stages that can be connected. Now, as I said in the beginning, that this kind of architecture, this is basically a blocking architecture. Because you can see that if at two inputs, they are trying to contend for the same destination, same output, they are bound to have some conflict at any one of these stages, maybe in terms of link or maybe in terms of switching element. So people started talking about how to reduce the block. That is one challenge. And another challenge, which is there, is in terms of redundancy. With this concept in mind, just by changing the connectivity between one stage to another stage, there are different architectures which have been proposed. One is your cube network, baseline network, Badian network, and likewise. The difference is only in terms of this type of connectivity. For example, if you are taking a similar kind, it will come out to be the similar kind of example. If you are taking a cube network, I'll just give you a hint. You can try to build this cube network and see the routing. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Any point, it has got three type of, three dimensions. One is in horizontal direction, another is in vertical direction, and the third one is in 
diagonal direction. And accordingly, you have got three stages. So you need to pair the numbers. Say, for example, horizontal, vertical, and diagonal. Zero, one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven. Similarly, vertical starts from zero, zero, four, one, five, two, six, three, seven. Zero, two. One three four six and five seven. You need to put these numbers connectivity level one, connectivity level two, and connectivity level three. And connect it. You will find different kind of interconnection between the stages and once you get the different kind of interconnection between the stages you will have the different architecture and there the routing pattern may not be same in most of these networks which i have mentioned here routing is slightly different in some of the cases, it compares with the source and destination address. Say, for example, if your source address is 100 and uh, take any one, 0, 1, 0, and they do it like this. That compare the first bit. If it is different, then diagonal. If it is same, then on the same bit. If it is arriving here and the number of bits are same for this stage, that will be connected like this. If different, then wherever it is coming, connect it diagonal. So, different kind of routing mechanisms for different architectures, they have been proposed, thereby increasing the complexity in taking the routing decision. For all these networks, which I have listed here, you have different mathematical formulas using which you derive the connectivity. But if you are able to visualize the connectivity with this kind of concept and then go for the mathematical formulas, you will be in a better position to appreciate those mathematical expressions which are providing the connectivity. Now, <clears throat> coming to those two issues which I mentioned earlier, one is in terms of blocking and another is in terms of providing redundancy for blocking the one of the solution which was proposed by different groups for almost all the kinds of network architecture that in order to minimize the blocking, you can provide buffers and for real-time signals, which you cannot buffer it, you just 
divert the path to delay it. And that diversion, again, in some of the architectures, you will find the secondary line like this. If something is going like that, and this is the way in which it is connected in almost all the nodes in order to maintain the similarity. For data purpose, the buffer structure was given at the input side. So there are three different types of buffering schemes or delaying schemes which have been tried on almost all the structures. One is input stage buffer. Second is output stage buffer. And the third one is intermediate stage buffer. With these kinds of buffering schemes, it's all okay. With these kinds of buffering schemes at different levels, it has been observed that if I can provide buffers at all the stages, this completely blocking architecture can be converted into completely non-blocking architecture. But having said this, everywhere there is a but, you need to find a solution to that but. The problem here is that if you are going to provide buffers at all the stages, all the stages means at all these switching elements, at all the input terminals, that will increase your hardware. And again, you need to see that if I'm going for these types of buffering here, why can't we go for single state switching? Because why, why we uh, remove that concept? Why do we ignore that concept and move to multi-state switching? Because of the switching elements there. Yet, of course, in terms of buffers and in terms of links, if we are talking about more redundancy, then we are putting it like this. Now, different experiments were carried out. First, all the three stages were given buffer. Later on, removing one by one, it has been experimented that output buffer will reduce the blocking by 60 to 70 percent. And people were happy with that. He, it's okay if I'm able to reduce the 60 to 70 percent buffers, the study blocking. Then we can go for non blocking architecture. Now, another dimension which is added to this kind of architecture is that, as I said, that you have different architectures in terms of having different kinds of connectivity. And accordingly, the routing strategy is also changed. So, 
people have started talking about, and that way, let me tell you, when they started talking about these things, when the advancements in the area of material science, in miniaturization, in power dissipation, in speed, that all advancement has taken place. When people started talking about reconfigurability, reconfigurable architecture, reconfigurable architecture means that you may have the basic block like this, 8 by 8, which is very simple. And the different other kinds of networks which I have listed there, in terms of cube, in terms of baseline, in terms of banyan. And if you are having 8 by 8, with cube, banyan, baseline, you can have the option of connectivity just by putting a common control signal from here. You can change the architecture of the network. If you are having control signal like 000, it may behave like a normal. This example which I have given. Maybe one, one, one. It may start behaving like a cube one, and so on. The advantage of such kind of configura reconfiguration is that this basic switching element that will remain safe. So, in VLSI, R at nano level, R at micron level, the important thing is that design of one module. And here, all the complexity, design complexities, they can be taken care of. Once this single element has been designed, you can go on repeating the same absolutely no problem and that gives you easy VLSI implementation so reconfigurable architecture that gives you easy implementation and this even implementation that also reduces the cost. We just have this way, I think. For the part, they have another lecture. So, now if you try to visualize the situation, I'm not trying to go for another architecture. If you try to visualize this situation, on this side, you have different circuit blocks. And on the other side also, you have different circuit blocks. And for providing the connectivity, you have in between this type of architecture. This can be reconfigurable, this can be standalone, and if you have more number of input and output signals, then you can have the network like 
n by n by n that means between this n to this n you have another switch r controller which takes numbers from here brings one out then another switch which gives you n numbers out that is a different kind of configuration so this is how on the connectivity front on a network on chip you have different types of network and the connectivity is provided now one of the important aspect which is coming these days one thing is that you have designed for once you have developed a routing algorithm and that routing algorithm that is applicable because it says static system if it is a dynamic system then challenges are different when i say dynamic system there can be changes at this level changes at output level and accordingly you may have to change your strategy so for any dynamic system whether it is here or in communication or in other environment two things are very important one is update update means how frequently information is information related to routing decision are updated that is number 1 and number 2 is how it is updated because and these two things these two uh, problems they are equally relevant and in fact derived from routing decision of any communication network and the architecture which i have described here in terms of multi stage interconnection networks this architecture this is also referred in communication networks and wherever you have to we have you have the requirement of high speed non blocking reduce delay or you can say minimum delay this mien structures they are used as a switch fabric and in communication initially when the um, very high speed networks were started developing in terms of gigabit internet in terms of 
high speed networks and uh, and that technology which, which came into picture uh, somewhere late 80s or early 90s and uh, that was the technology which was giving this feature very high speed about at that time about 155 mbps which was considered to be very high and there were two standards which were proposed of 155 mbps and 622 mbps and at that time it was very high in order to realize that this was the switch fabric which was considered when i say this was the switch fabric not necessarily this architecture other architectures which I listed here, those architectures they were also considered for uh, considered as a potential candidate for very high speed switches. So that's it from my side. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Any questions? Any doubt? Any clarification? Yeah, somewhere the mic is not. Please feel free to ask. It is requested from the participants to kindly uh, respond uh, regarding. Abhishek Kumar, are you speaking anything because uh, or if you are uh, asking for anything, then please unmute yourself. Okay, somewhere what you do, how to motivate them to ask the question. So you are from sir, may I ask one question, sir? Yeah, please, please. Uh, sir, uh, which uh, nanoparticle we are using in these uh, communication chips? Uh, you no, are... as, of, as of now, uh, this architecture, this is not in market using the nanotechnology. Okay. Right? Okay, sir. So, uh, 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 what do you feel? Uh, which uh, material we would be using for nano wires in these chips? Both the materials are available, but I think that uh, the, the connectivity sir, with the one carbon tube. Uh, uh, the one second, please. Awaz nahi aayi, sir. Acha. So that may be well addressed by materials people. But uh, mm. as of now, whatever technology is available at nano level in terms of carbon nanotube or graphene mix kind of material, which people have started using for sensors, for sensor application, micro sensor, drug delivery, etc. Uh, mm. That can be Good. considered. But we will have to see the potential of how to put them, how to connect them and mm -hmm. how to program them for taking the big decision. That means it is in very infancy state, sir. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, okay. That is what I'm trying to say, that you have all the things open in this technology, that if these concepts are clear, then at mm -hmm. the material level, how to implement it, that can give you a new dimension. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Very nicely explained, sir. Uh, the switching mechanism uh, is now very clear. But you won't be able to retain, let me tell you very honestly, unless and until you see a book, revise it, and see the mathematical part, this I have tried to explain you in a very simple manner. Yes, sir. Now, if you will see from the mathematics point of view, then that will make the things permanent. 
And once these things are in permanent in your mind, then when you are going to implement it, all these functionalities will be clearly in front of your mind, and then you will enjoy it. So, which book okay. do you suggest, sir? Any computer architecture book you can take. Okay, okay, sir. Okay. Because it's a Any originally it's a part of originally it's a part of computer architecture. What you can have it? My book is up specified because it's a subjective thing. I may like some book, you may not like that book because the way of presentation keeps on varying from author to author. Okay, okay. Sir. thank you so much, sir. Right, thank you. Anything else? Anybody else would like to ask any questions? Can go ahead. If no questions are there, then uh, I think we are going to meet in the Validity session again. You may prepare yourself. If you have any questions at that time also, you are free to ask the question. Thank you all. Thanks for uh, your patience hearing. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It was a wonderful lecture, and uh, we were uh, felt like uh, we are in the again in the class and uh, learning through the whiteboard. So it was a wonderful lecture, sir. Very practically held, and uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, now we are uh, again going to start with uh, another lecture with uh, uh, Professor David Harvey, sir, and uh, I hope he is uh, uh, here. I'm yes, sir. Here. Yeah. Oh okay. yes, David is here. Do, do you need to take a short break, five minutes, or continue? So we would prefer that uh, we can continue just because we would be having a validatory sign. So we are not having much time left. So that's uh, uh, so that's why I suggest you uh, if any participants side any views are there regarding that, then we can uh, go up to that. Otherwise, we can uh, go with the session. I'm fine to start. I'm just thinking if anybody wants a short break. Anyway, yeah. we can start. Yeah. OK, I'll start to share the screen. लो भाई साहब तुम्हारे काम कैसे साफ करके दे ही हां तो भी नहीं नैपकिन नहीं है अदरवाइज आई वुड हैव रब्ड इट ओके Can you see this, Samia? Yes, sir. It is visible, sir. Okay, let's let's start then, because uh, we're, we're a bit short of time today. And if possible, I want to leave uh, some time for you to have five or ten minutes before the final session to uh, clear your heads. So that was interesting. Uh, looking at switching, I did mention in my design lectures that. Uh, not only switching of the transistor is important, but the interconnection time and interconnection network is also important for things like network on chip, uh, GALS design, remember globally synchronous, locally synchronous design. And then you have switching fabrics for different types of uh, computers and communication systems. So all fits together. So as we go into the nano field, uh, things will speed up get smaller and we'll have problems we had uh, at a macro level, but we'll have new problems introduced. So what I want to talk about in this uh, short session is some results from uh, worldwide research to do with nanotechnology that I've been involved with. So I've worked with a few uh, world cast research groups. Um, these are based in different countries in the world. Uh, Malaysia, Japan, Australia, Hong Kong, uh, and so on. So I'm going to look at a, two or three different projects so you can see 
where nanoparticles in particular nanotechnology may be introduced, uh, uh, presently being introduced and in the future. So the first project is on green electronics. I've got a short presentation on this project. Then we go into a bit more detail about nanoparticles over the last five or 10 years, how people have tried to introduce them into solder to enhance mechanical interconnection properties. So if you enhance mechanical properties, it means the electrical connection is also there. So you also enhance the electrical properties over time, so to increase the lifetime of the product. So if you have more reliable solder joints, generally that means you've got more reliable electronic systems. And finally, we did mention a little bit about EMC in the testing lectures. I've just got a couple of uh, short videos. If, if we can play them, that's why I've left them until the end. If I might not play over the network, just to show you the things as engineers, we need to still be careful of and take care in our design. OK, so the first project, you may have seen it uh, in Glasgow in the UK. We had a major climate change conference in uh, October, November called COP26. It's the 26th meeting of all the partners working on uh, climate change. And in the UK, uh, in conjunction with Japan, funded only four projects to do the COP26 uh, initiative and my university, me in particular, applied for one of these projects with a university in Japan, Gumma University and the University of Malaysia, the University of Malaysia Perlis and was successful in getting a one-year grant. It's only one-year grant, it's quite, quite uh, impactful but it's really to get the three parties to work together. So we've nearly finished the project now. It's due to end in end of March, but we're trying to extend it due to the problems with COVID because we weren't able to physically meet. And at the end of the project, we are planning to do a major seminar in Malaysia, probably in the autumn next year. So we're trying to advance what we call green electronics using uh, new types of solder materials. So if by green electronics, we mean we may be using uh, materials that aren't harmful to the environment, such as uh, lead that's been taken out of solder. Most solder is now lead free. And uh, we're trying to design new green solders. So the beauty is that it's a complementary team. We've all got different expertise. And I'll show you in the next couple of slides how we're able to design new solder materials, and we're still in the process of testing their properties. So the, the strap line is, if we can double a product lifetime, then the manufacturing and recycling costs will be approximately halved. So this is where the green part comes in. So we're saving energy, we're extending lifetimes, and we're using less materials. So good all around. So we had some objectives and any research project, if you ever have to put one together, has to have deliverables and objectives. So we established a new research network. We hadn't worked together as a team of three before, so we did that. We're trying to promote it mainly in the Asian country, Malaysia. And there's a big, uh, I would say, uh, big impacts in Malaysia because Malaysia has a lot of uh, electronics and solder and industry there. So this is ongoing. The partner in Malaysia, the university is well connected, is head of one of the tin research associations. So we've already been over in a previous project to present work there. And it's having quite an impact, I would say, in Malaysia, which is the intention. So we're using novel lead-free solders. We want it to be high reliability. And we're looking at possibly applications for power electronics and electric vehicles, because electric vehicles of all types are coming up. So what did we do? Well, one of the partners is an expert on material science. They fabricated solder alloys. Another partner is good at evaluation. So they help to evaluate the solder joints. 
And then what do we actually do? Well, you have to put nanoparticles into the typical uh, tin, silver, copper, solder alloy. Uh, materials scientists call this micro alloying. You only put in a small amount of nanoparticles, but it has, can have a huge difference to the mechanical properties. So it can affect things as you put a nanoparticle into a solder. Uh, important things such as melting temperature and wettability will change. Uh, live tests, we need to see what the effects are on vibration and thermal cycling. And how do we monitor it with a mechanism, which is the work we do in my own group. And what's the performance on the interconnects, particularly for power electronics. So a couple of entry teams, I'm going to tell you about each one very quickly. UNIMAP is a university in North Malaysia, Gumma University in Japan, and my own university, Liverpool John Moores University is in the UK. So to start with, we had the COVID, COVID pandemic. So to get some publicity, which is uh, always part of research, to get it out into the public domain, a webinar was organised fairly early in the. We started work in about March, April 2021, and on June 21st of June 2021, we had a webinar on green electronics for electric vehicle manufacturing with speakers from each of the partners. And as today you can see, there's always a problem with international webinars uh, getting the time synchronised. So. The webinar started at 3.30 in Malaysia and was organised through Malaysia, which is 4.30 p.m. in Tokyo, 8.30 a.m. in the UK. And we had about 190 participants. In fact, it's more than it's over 200 once we've counted everybody up. So quite good for an online webinar, mainly promoting the work on new soldiers in Malaysia. And you can see the poor UK, we all always have to get up very early to work with our Asian friends, but we, we don't mind doing it. So the University of Malaysia uh, has a group on electronic packaging materials, and they have a bigger material science departments, and these are the sort of things they're trying to do. They can fabricate solder alloys through casting, they can work out some mechanical properties, they can fabricate solder balls, small enough for ball degree interconnect. So we're talking about uh, diameter of solder balls, about uh, 50 to 60 plus microns uh, diameter. And we've got good facilities there for looking at microstructures and the thermal properties. So these pictures here, just to go through a few, here's a number of solder balls placed onto a chip, which is ready to be fabricated onto a circuit board. Here's some of the analysis you can see, different analysis around the solder balls. Here's an analysis of microstructure. And one of the important ones, which people don't realize, is this thing called tin whiskers. So here's a solder ball, and you can see the dimensions of 50 micron. And what will happen if you've got a solder ball mainly based on tin? and no one really understands fully how this works, whiskers will just erupt. They can see whiskers here coming out in all directions and they grow. So if you've got a connection of solder balls like this, if whiskers grow from one solder ball to another or from both solder balls, obviously if they meet in the matrix here, they'll cause a short circuit. So tin whiskers is a problem and Many people in the world are looking at how to uh, design to try and eliminate these tin whiskers. So that's an ongoing problem. So a group from Malaysia, just to show you the people, uh, they do some analysis on materials. And as I said, it's a worldwide uh, research field now. They have to go to uh, the Synchroton to get some of a detailed analysis of uh, uh, solder materials. Um, there's no suitable synchroton close to the university, so we actually have to go to Thailand. You can't really read it, but they, they apply 
to get uh, research time on the synchrotron in Thailand. And actually, they're part of Malaysia's on the border with Thailand, so it's not so far. And we also use uh, the synchrotron in other countries, such as Japan. And they have to book time on, so you're probably working through the night. You might only have access for a few hours. So you very quickly do the experiments, so we'll take a whole team over. I can see these people of a team from Malaysia working in this uh, synchrotron. Here's a team in Japan here. I've not been to Japan, but you can see the uh, Professor Shoji is there with one of his colleagues and a research assistant and then some uh, research students. And all these people, which is a fairly large team, just looking at solder. So looking at how to join solder and reliability of solder, and particularly how you might use it in the uh, automotive industry. And for automotive industry, you're looking at new parts that go to devices such as silicon carbide. So they want high, reli high reliability in their materials for joining electronics. And here's a quick graph about Japan. Like most other countries in the world, it's trying to go carbon neutral and reduce amount of CO2. So in our university, they've got uh, equipment for testing the mechanical properties of solder. So we'll get some solder balls made in the Unimap. We've got a ball impact test machine and we've got a shear tool which will literally press the solder ball until it breaks off the uh, connection and the plots the graph of this. We can look at the microstructure, which we'll look at in a bit more detail later on. And in the microstructure, you've got the solder here connected to a copper pad. And the interface called the IMC is the intermetallic compound area. It's a brittle area where the solder and the joint of a pad is uh, like an, an interface, an intermetallic interface. And usually this is more brittle than the solder, so the cracking, when the solder joint starts to break, will tend to be in the intermetallic compound interface. So you want to keep this interface as strong and as small as possible. Okay, so what we'll do with John Moore's, where you've seen some of our stuff earlier, we have an ultrasound machine, we have a 2D uh, X-ray machine, and we can make circuit boards with flip chips on. We've got our acoustic microscope and we can section chips. You can see possibly in this one was a crack here between the solder joint and the connection. And you can see typically a solder joint looks like this. This is a lead and tin solder joint, so with different materials are showing up in different colours. And on one test we did on a power BGA device. When we firmly cycled it, the solder joints didn't break, but you can see the metal wires interconnecting the silicon to the output pin uh, due to thermal cycling actually broke. The world create an open circuit, so something people don't realise it. You still have metal interconnections quite often inside chips, and these are thin wires, so they can break uh, even before the solder can break in some circumstances. <coughs> The project we were involved with about 10 years ago now, we got one of the world's first embedded chips, which is where the chip is embedded into the circuit board. So if you look at this chip here, the chip's about one centimetre square and the circuit board's two centimetres square. So physically, the hole is made in the circuit board and the chip is dropped in. So the top of the chip and the circuit board are fairly flat. So when this was made, you can see the different layers here. You've got a FR4 is the circuit board, flame retardant 4. You've got a copper connection on top. You've got some die attached material to attach the chip. You've got the chip itself. Then you have another layer of resin, and then you've got connections on the top. So when this went through some type of uh, thermal soaking and thermal cycling, sometimes the die attach or the chip was separating or delaminating from one of the bottom layers. It's very difficult to find this. So with ultrasound, we were able to do a 2D scan. 
the red area indicates an air bubble or a delamination in one of the layers. We're able to gate it. This is the A scan I talked about before. This is a C scan, which is a planar scan. So this is a, a, a scan of a layer. And we're not sure which of the layers it is because these layers are quite thin, a few microns. So my colleague and some students over a number of years developed a wavelet transform a processing toolbox. And we can separate the layers in the 2D scan based on this A scan and the pulses here into different layers. And we've now separated into three layers here. And the green, uh, the green bubble on the middle layer is equivalent to this uh, red pseudo color on this 2D image. And this shows us which layer the delamination was. The delamination is actually of a diatached layer. So this enabled good information to be passed back to the Fraunhofer Institute in Berlin, in Germany, to help with what may be going wrong with design in terms of maybe application of the diatach. So it's basic research, but the whole thing of doing the toolbox, writing the program is about 10 years research coming to fruition in a real problem solving uh, example. <coughs> Other things we do, I've shown you already in the previous uh, talks, but we've got a solder bomb there. You can see it's attached to a complicated system, which we'll see more later on. And we don't tend to attach solder bumps straight onto copper. We tend to have this underbolt metallization of different layers and we have to accommodate for that in our simulations such as here and in the designs. So for example, we want the solder to be on the pad. We don't really want it to be doing this sort of thing. OK, this was a one year project. So we've developed new legendary solder materials as part of this project and we've added in nanoparticles and work will be produced and uh, put in the public domain fairly shortly. So I want to talk quickly in the last 30 minutes to leave some time for questions, if you have any, about nanoparticles in solder. So I'm lucky that I've met some very uh, good people in this field over the past 10 or 20 years. And recently, people have been looking at nanoparticles and how maybe you can add them into solder to make a stronger joints. And this is summarized in the next few slides. So what's a nanoparticle look like? Well, I've not made it and I get the impression it's quite difficult to make nanoparticles. So this is work done in uh, City University of Hong Kong. And this is using tin and bismuth solders. The reason you want to use this solder is it's a lower melting point than some of the more common solders. And the idea was, can you make it stronger by adding in uh, particles of silver? So the silver particles are of different sizes. So there's one with a particle size of 31 nanometers, plus or minus five. And you can see a bunch of particles here. There's another set of nanoparticles with an average size of 76 nanometers. And a third set with an average size of 133 nanometers. The idea is going to add some of these nanoparticles into the solder composite and hopefully it will increase the properties with regards to mechanical strength and increase for lifetime. So let's see what happens. So the important thing is, well, as you know, gold and silver to add them into any device is quite expensive, but we're only adding in 1% weight of nanoparticles and this is typically the low percentage we add in between I'd say half a percent to two percent of nanoparticles and it's dispersed inside the paste. So we've got three types of uh, material to look at with the different size nanoparticles in and we're going to look at the properties. I'm not a material science expert but you should be able to see here um, there's different materials inside this uh, microscopic picture of the solder. So you've got a tin-rich region, which is the darker grey colour, a bismuth 
rich region, which is a lighter grey colour. And where we've added in banana particles with small particles of a different colour, you may be just able to make out on the periphery of some of the uh, crystal crystal structures. So it forms intermetallic particles in various sizes. What we're talking about intermetallic particles is what happens in the region when we solder this onto a proper component. Looking at the microstructure, this is the original solder, tin with bismuth, which is a classical lower temperature solder. Although we call it lower temperature, it still melts at about 183 degrees C. So we still need to get towards 200 degrees C to melt the solder to make a connection. With 31 nanometer particles, you see the structure has changed. It probably looks finer than this one, and the finer structure generally is a good indication. With 76 nanometer nanoparticles, it looks finer again. And with 133 nanometer particles, it looks a bit coarser. So I would say that the 76 is the best. So looking at those pictures, you say it's the most effective refinement in the nanostructure of a microstructure. So what that should mean is that this solder should be the strongest. Uh, this one and this one are probably stronger than the original, but we'll see as we go through the work. So first of all, they measured the micro hardness, so higher is better. So there's the 76 nanometer particles, it's got the highest micro hardness. The other two are slightly lower and the original is lower again. So this is the preferred one. Which is strange because you would expect the smaller nanoparticles to form uh, in the crystal boundaries and make a stronger joint. When you look at the shear strength, it's a similar picture. 76 is the pink one. This is overall better, although 133, the green one, is pretty close. 31 nanometer particles is a bit less, and the original solder is less. So addition of any nanoparticles has improved mechanical properties of the joint, but <clears throat> the 76 nanoparticle, nanometer particles is the best. So let's look at the theory. There's a lot of the equations which are dreamt up by different people. So if you've got a radius of a particle, R, and a radius of the average grain, the smaller the R, the smaller the grain size. Normally we want a smaller grain size for better mechanical properties. So now the particle size goes down, grain size goes down, better refinement. The next relationship, the yield stress, you want it to be high, is proportional to the grain diameter to the minus a half. So as you take the grain diameter down, make it smaller, the yield stress or the strength goes up. So this is a good thing as well. And the dispersion strength, again, the yield stress, should be inversely proportional to the distance of a dispersed particle. So particle size goes down, the distance goes down, you would expect the yield stress, which is a better mechanical process, to go up. So what happens in uh, theory doesn't always happen in practice. What we do with experiments, a large degree of improvement. Why not in group experiment, experimental results? we found, or the team at Hong Kong found, 76 nanometers silver particles is better than a smaller or a bigger particle. So the reason is when you get to smaller particles, they tend to start, uh, what they say, agglomeration or sticking together. So instead of having individual particles dispersed in your solder, you're now having groups of particles. So smaller nanoparticles, more surface energy, there's more chance for them going to stick together, increases the average size. So if you get a bunch of nanoparticles here, 31 nanometers sticking together, it only takes three of them, and the bigger than a 76 nanometer particle, and won't give as good a performance. So more chance of agglomeration is bad. Smaller particles in theory should be better. 
Well, it's a compromise, like most engineering, we have to go for a middle ground. So then another experiment looked at putting tungsten as a nanoparticle into the solder alloy. And this time it was half a percent weight wise of tungsten, so quite a low percentage. So this is in the same solder. So if we look at what happens. This is a standard solder using the uh, tin bismuth, tin bismuth. And then when we add in the particles, you can see quickly there that the nanostructure in this one is coarser than this one. The scale is the same. You can probably see the scale of 20 micron. So add in tungsten nanoparticles. Uh, it significantly refined the nanostructure. We did a, an X-ray analysis, which can tell you the chemical composition, which is similar to the beam time that the Malaysian team do in the Go Green project. And this means something to material sciences. I'm an electronic engineer, although being any type of engineer, you need to understand other uh, fields like material science nowadays. You can see that the uh, tungsten, the W is here, and on the trace it's fairly similar to the trace for the standard solder without the nanoparticles, but it shows that uh, it's been doped in successfully. It's joined into this uh, solder and we can see that. When we do the micro hardness again, it's higher with the nanoparticles than without, so it's an improvement to the mechanical strength. So now we're going to look at uh, intermetallic compounds, which are where a lot of failures will occur in solder joints. So we've got a typical solder joint here, and there's a copper connection, which is usually on a circuit board, or it could be on a chip. And we don't just solder the solder straight onto the copper nowadays. We have this uh, underbump metallization, normally in two or three different flavors. So in this one, is a three micron deposition of nickel on top of a copper, which helps to make the solder joint. When we heat all this together, the whole thing uh, melts into a sort of uh, conglomerate on the boundary. Then we put a very thin layer of gold, one micron thick, on top, probably to stop the nickel degrading when it's exposed to the air. When you look at these microstructures now again, you can see there the standard solder without one, the uh, tungsten. Here's one with the tungsten over here. And you can see that the properties are different. If you're looking at the patterns in the crystallized or microstructure, you can see there's differences. And it's trying to point out, difficult to see on here, but if you do the X-ray analysis, you can point out at each point where the things are. So, because there is only a very fine level of gold and gold is fairly inert, it's entirely dissolved into a molten solder, which is really what you intend. And then the nickel layer and the copper layer acts as a buffer between the solder layer. Then once you've heated it up, you can see it's melted into these uh, two pictures on the right. And it forms all these different compounds, which may be of interest more to material science people. But what about the properties? So, right, we'll look at the strength. So, the shear strength on the shear strength test in the red is with the tungsten particles. You can see it's got a higher strength than the original solder. And at the microstructural level, level, you can see that you want a small microstructure, but these larger particles that are developing will probably end up to cracking. So you want to try and avoid these. 
And why does it uh, build up? Well, it tends to thicken in the layer due to mechanical degradation over time. And as this thickens, you'll get a crack forming. So, and the cracks forming because the intermetallic layer or these layers are more brittle. Okay, so, and this uh, tungsten doping going to the results is suppressing the formation of these layers, so it's enhancing the strength of the joint, so it's a good thing. So we did mention very briefly uh, electromigration, which is becoming more important as things shrink down because you're getting uh, heating and voltage profiles across shoulder joints, which can cause problems. So this has been done for 720 hours, and you can see that there's a, a, a standard tin bismuth joint, and here's one with the tungsten nanoparticles. You can see the microstructure here looks slightly finer than here, but the important thing is probably uh, by the cathode. So the bismuth atom, atoms migrate up to the anode. And the tin atoms tend to migrate to the cathode, and this can cause phase separation. And by putting tungsten in, it's stopping this migration. So by stopping migration, it'll increase reliability due to electro migration. So after we've done the test, not me, but the people, my collaborators, you can see the differences on the three normal solder without any nanoparticles and in the similar solder with nanoparticles, you can see that the layers are different. So definitely a change by adding it in. So AU migrates to the cathode, so this is causing mechanical degradation. And by adding in the nanoparticle, it is stopping the migration of the gold. Okay. Now that's gone quicker than I thought, but if we've optimized the nanoparticle size, we improve nanoparticle reinforced solders most effectively. Now it's been verified experimentally by these teams around the world. It's backed up by theoretical analysis. And the tungsten nanoparticles uh, improve reliability of aging and improve the reliability due to possible electro migration. <clears throat> so I need to acknowledge the people that did all this work. Uh, and again, it was mentioned earlier in the week that you should really try and uh, network with your colleagues on this particular Guian course, but I was lucky enough to meet certain people, and the main professor, Y.C. Chan, who was at the City University of Hong Kong, I only met him because we attended an electronic manufacturing conference over 10 years ago, and got to know his work, and were able to uh, see our common interests as well as our complementary interests, and formed uh, working relationship I'd say over the past 10 years and this has included uh, having people from Hong Kong, uh, undergraduates and postgraduate students in our laboratories as uh, summer interns and also uh, having uh, keynote lectures from Professor Chan at my own university. <clears throat> but these things take time to build up and the common interests have grown and we're still in touch today. On the Go Green project, we only started this Go Green project because uh, a team from Malaysia were working with other colleagues in my own university and they came uh, to visit Liverpool. So again, we started to meet the people there and then over a period of, let's say, five years, we've been developing projects. We've had two funded projects in my own area of solder and we hope to get more projects. Professor Jung from the University of Seoul 
Uh, he's also an expert on solar. He came across to give a keynote lecture funded by one of the UK research councils. And so we were able to meet him. But so far with the pandemic, we've not been able to travel to South Korea. And a lot of other people have helped with the work, you know, PhD students in all these institutes and my own institute and colleagues have been very valuable people to work with. OK, so before we give you a short break so that you can prepare for the final session. Do you remember what you said in our testing? You have to think about your product such as a mobile phone in this uh, graphic, is radiating electromagnetic waves. And what about the electromagnetic interference uh, or electromagnetic combat compatibility EMC? How does that affect other devices? <clears throat> I used to run a, <clears throat> an EMC test centre in Liverpool and we used to run courses for companies and one of the uh, anecdotal stories was when mobile phones were first available, you may remember in one of my slides it's like a house brick, uh, a salesman came round to a major automotive company and his phone started to ring and of course in those days not many people had mobile phones. <clears throat> this is probably the old, uh, old fashioned ones. And as soon as the mobile phone started to ring, there was a major crane in that factory, uh, overhead crane used for lifting heavy items started to move. So this was pretty frightening because it had never happened before. And the reason was in those days, the overhead crane in the factory had been designed appropriately, always been working, had no problems. But because of the new mobile phone, uh, it hadn't been expected that such an item would exist. So a new mobile phone emitted some radiation into the control uh, circuitry of this uh, overhead crane, which caused it to move. So this meant that the people design the control system for the crane would have to completely redesign the control system to protect it from radio frequency uh, transmission also would mean that the pill design of a phone should redesign the phone so it doesn't irradiate so much uh, frequency of a certain uh, frequency that's going to damage other items. So we have EMC standards. All appliances have to be designed to be compatible. So that means we don't radiate sufficient frequency outside and cause damage and they're not susceptible. For example, uh, if you've got a pacemaker, the pacemaker is not susceptible to most radiation it might see. It may mean you can't go through scanning systems at airports. That's fine if you know about it, but if you don't, it can cause problems. But overall, I'm going to show you if we can run these two videos in a moment. But electromagnetic radiation does affect humans. And we have to be very careful about this because it can affect our health. Anyway, let me show you this. So the first one is about uh, how a problem due to EMC or whatever with electronics could affect uh, a car. Well, let's Imagine see. this, you're driving a So I hope you're not too disturbed by that. Probably no one's injured in making this video. But what happened there is the car's probably on a drive-by wire type system. So something has happened to make the car accelerate uh, due to a fault in picking up an external signal or a fault in the system itself. Um, these are things as engineers we need to try and minimize. And the second video 
is looking at how all these gadgets available now and in the future can affect uh, you as a human and also say you're on an aeroplane this picture shows why is it an aeroplane how maybe you can affect the control of the aeroplane which is very frightening so if you have a nervous disposition don't watch it but i say it's causing see them so what this is showing is that people on an airplane obviously turn it on smart glasses smart watch notebook cell phone if you can use a cell phone which sometimes you can now on airplanes gradients and all this uh, even though we're designed not to radiate too much uh, emc type of emissions here's the wires which could be connecting the uh, control systems in an aeroplane and as more people using devices all the noise adds up and eventually it could cause failure not only that it's also using all this uh, these devices is irradiating your body so that's something you also got to be careful so finally i just want to show you this slide which sums up really how the agglomeration of nanoparticles can cause problems. Really, you want this to be spaced out evenly, and nanoparticles to be individual for the best uh, microstructure. <coughs> so, in the <coughs> sorry, in the bulk folder, you've got some problems. So, more work to be done here. And on the substrates, you have these intermetallic compounds. You need to somehow protect them from being brittle so a lot of work still to do and um, my advice is keep working and work on your own but also work as part of a team and you'll generate something useful okay so i'm going to stop sharing now and see if there's any final questions before we have a break before the final session Okay, is Samia there? Yes, sir, I'm there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay. the, the boss is there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a different banner. I was in a different program, so I just quickly changed my background, okay? <laughs> oh, that's okay. Yeah, okay. You're a busy man. So, before we, I don't know if I have time later, but I want to personally thank, thank Somia for all the help she's given us this week. Thank and you so much. Sir. And also, Professor Sir, thank you for your help. <laughs> thank you very much, sir. Our pleasure. It is you who contributed and uh, all entire program is, you are the master of the program, okay? So that way, your contribution a lot, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, hopefully people have gained something from it and I'll, I'm available for questions if there's any question. Yeah, so I, I encourage all the participants, please ask question if you have any. 
participants uh, possibly uh, this is the last day of the program although you'll keep <coughs> we will have access uh, through whatsapp email uh, of course we are going to have but uh, you know face to face and online access this is the last day of the program so take this advantage and ask question if you have any hope i'm audible to all the participants am i please acknowledge if i'm audible not to me yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm requesting the participants to acknowledge participants uh, would you like to ask any yes questions? sir you are audible yeah thank you very much uh, i can see professor rajiv tripathi sir is also <laughs> present uh, <laughs> so any, any question from the participant side? Anything you would like to clarify or add to the discussion? Your experience with the program or ex your uh, experience with the nanotechnology that we are talking about? You would like to contribute to it. Okay, so feel free to do do it. Maybe some knowledge you would like to contribute or some of your experience or laboratory experiments that you have conducted. If you would like to share with us. I am. We are not getting any response, sir. Uh, so I'll quickly announce the how we are going to have the next one hour. I'll I'll quickly announce, and uh, then maybe we'll break for five minutes. And uh, so, can we have the slides of the FDP? Yeah, I, I wish to get response from uh, Professor Harvey. Uh, so I'm I'm sure that you are going to share the slides uh, with us. Uh, yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah. 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 So we will be doing it. Uh, and video lectures also you, later on you will have access to the video lectures. So that will be further better. OK, so definitely you're going to have access to the slides, video lectures and all the teaching learning material. Some material we have already uploaded on Google Classroom. So those those things are also available. Yeah. Any other quick question? If not, then uh, I'll quickly tell you how we are going to spend next uh, one hour. So in the next one hour, again, we are going to meet at 5 o'clock, 5 to 5.30, we are going to have the examination. So examination will be having 30 number of objective type questions, uh, and uh, it is expected that we'll be taking around 30 minutes or even less than 30 minute time to respond to it. And we'll <laughs> reassemble. All of you need to be connected while uh, responding to the question. So a Google link you're going to get your, on your WhatsApp, on your uh, Google Classroom, and maybe those who have access to chat box, there also will share on MS team, we'll be sharing the Google Classroom link. So half an hour, we'll have the examination, and followed by immediately after the examination, we are going to have the concluding validatory session. So validatory session, we'll try to finish within 25 minute time. So uh, we'll start with uh, my uh, brief lecture on proceedings of the program. So five days how we, we have done it. So proceeding of, of the uh, program I'll be presenting and we are going to request all the participants to share their feedback. So while sharing your feedback, you are requested to switch on your camera and share your feedback. At least five, six number of people if you can share your feedback, not necessarily positive feedback, negative feedbacks are more welcome. Uh, so further we are going to improve in fu future programs uh, also. So that way, please be prepared to share your feedback, uh, positive, negative, or some something, some advices if you'd like to share with us for the next program, we'll be happy to incorporate those in the next program. And then followed by lecture by Professor Rajiv Tripathi sir, some remark by Professor Raj uh, Rajiv Tripathi sir and Professor Harvey sir. So that way we are going to conclude. So we'll divide the validity in two components, one examination and then followed by half an hour concluding uh, validity session. So if no question, then we break for uh, around six minutes and reassemble at uh, five, five o'clock.
participants do you have anything to share any any question it's an opportunity for all of you to ask question so seven minute time can be effectively used by asking questions all the expert members are present here professor rajiv tripathi professor harve so it appears that they are in pressure with the examination sir <laughs> so yes. maybe uh, yeah so they are uh, they are taking their time to utilizing their time to prepare for the examination it's because it's like a break of thing before yeah, yeah so it will break for 5 minute and then reassemble at 5 5 o'clock okay yeah, i'll be here i'll see you shortly 5, five o'clock indian time and your time may be i i i, I don't know uh it is 11:30 possibly 11:30 or 12:30 half wings in watch i can turn it both ways indian time or <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <that's> <laughs> okay. 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 See you shortly. See you. See you. Within five minutes, we will reassemble. Thank you very much. Thank you all the participants. Nice to see you.
so participants still we need uh, four more minutes time to share the link for the question paper uh, so please stay with us for another four minutes okay so within four minute time we are going to share the link
So participants, now we have uploaded uh, link is available on your WhatsApp. So please visit WhatsApp and uh, see the link. It will take you to Google uh, Google uh, Forms, and your responses will be captured in Google Google Form. Okay. So please tell me if anyone has have not received it, or if you have any difficulty. Wish you all the best for your examination. Now we have started at 5.07. We'll continue till 5.37. Okay. 5.37 till 5.37. We'll continue. So link is available on the Google Classroom as well. So they can uh, uh, get the link if anybody is having fetching uh, link from the uh, WhatsApp, then they can uh, fetch the link from the Google Classroom as well. Thank you very much, Samya. So here also can we put uh, those who are internal to the organization, we, they can get access to. So on message also, if you can put it. Chat section of the MS Teams. Samya, please okay, put the, yeah, put okay, the link sir. on chat section. So participants, is there anyone who has not received it? The link is available three places, chat section, your WhatsApp messages, Google Classroom. Still I'm asking, is there anyone who has not received it? Since I'm not getting any response, I assume that all of you have received it, okay? Sir, can it be sent to Gmail? To Gmail. Tripura Gmail, Gmail account. I'll, I'll do that. Okay, so special. No, I do not know why you are asking for it, but uh, I saw your email as well. I'm not happy about it. So I'm, I'm doing it right now. Tripura. Okay, sir. Same link. Same no? Yes. Okay. Excuse me, sir. Yes, Excuse please. Me, sir. Yes, sir, I didn't. I didn't receive uh, the assignment. Not able to see the assignment, is it? Yes, sir. And uh, I think my mobile number is not added. I, I think. Mr. Kumar. That's why. Yes, yeah, sir. please send your mobile number. Somya, please note his mobile number and send send a link immediately. Nine three. So I hope you are noting. So pardon, uh, repeat once more. Nine three. Nine three one eight eight. Yeah. One one two three one. Okay, I'm doing it, sir. Doctor Dr. Tripurari, can you share your email ID? Sir, this link is there in my email ID now. Is it? Okay, okay. It That's great. Will be in the email ID. Okay, sir. Right. So, hope it is taken care of. Thank you very much. Yes, still, is there anyone who has still difficulty with it? Those who have completed need to stay back. OK, so we'll start the next session at 537.
So participants, hopefully many of you have completed it. But in any case, uh, do you feel that you require more time?
So participants' time is al almost done. Uh, we are left with only one and a half minute time. I can see from my record only 25 of you have submitted. So still waiting for more responses to be submitted. Okay. So another one and a half minute time only. Okay. So honorable participants time uh, almost we have completed time rather completed. And I can see from my record only 29 of you have submitted the responses still 10 more responses are awaited. So do you feel that uh, you require more time or uh, we can proceed with the next program? Those who have not submitted. One of you may please respond. Since I'm not getting any response, I assume that all of you are comfortable with the time allocated. System is going to close. Uh, no submission. Sir, I need more time. Yeah, Renu Gupta, how much time, Dr. Renu, you require? One more minute. Two minutes, sir. Two minutes. Okay. So we'll wait for two, one and a half minute from now. So try to complete, uh, Dr. Renu. So till now we have received only 30 responses. I, I think there are many people, nine of you who have not completed yet. Please expedite. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, now we are proceeding. I uh, hope Dr. Renu, you have completed uh, with the extra time given to you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating in the examination, and we have received responses as, as well. Now I request we are proceeding with the validatory session, the last session of this five days uh, training program, Gyan training program. I request Samya to start the proceedings. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, starting with the program, uh, very.
warm good evening to all uh, intellectuals invite, invited guests professors and participants i'm somya gupta from school of management studies mnit allahabad it is a matter of immense pride to be with you all for the validatory session of this 5 day gyan program on advances in nanotechnology and its applications in future electronics before starting with the program let me first acknowledge the presence of some of our eminent guest it is indeed our pleasure to have among us the chief guest of the validatory function professor david harvey sir professor rajit tripathi sir coordinator of uh, coordinator of this five days program and professor gp sahu sir co coordinator of this program and local coordinator gyan to grace this occasion i request all the eminent uh, dignitaries to the vir uh, virtual dais words of welcome fill an occasion with the warmth and makes one feel that we are meant to be here so i request professor gp sahu sir co coordinator of this program to deliver welcome address and brief the proceedings of the program to all over to you sir yeah th thank you very much samya for starting this uh, validatory <coughs> program and uh, throughout you your support is tremendous or uh, i i must acknowledge that uh, you supported this program uh, respected uh, professor david harvey sir uh, chief guest of the session and uh, the foreign faculty expert member of this uh, program five days program on advances in nanotechnology and its application in future electronics respected professor rajiv tripathi sir one of the resource person but at the same time you are the coordinator and we conceived this program whether uh, submitted the proposal along with you uh, with your guidance supervision uh, all the other members who are participating all the participants of, of this program and student coordinator good evening to all of you um, i'm thankful to all the participants and on <coughs> members present here on the dais uh, that opportunity given to me to talk about the proceedings of the program so it was a five days program online gyan course on advances in nanotechnology and its application in future electronics we started on 7th of march and every day we had four hours of intera uh, interaction and lecture session including few tutorial classes and also lab classes so this is the schedule of the program we have exactly gone as per the schedule given or discussed in the on day 1 or shared with all of you all the participants so we started inaugural on 7th of march and continued with the lecture by professor david harvey on modern digital electronics design techniques synchronous design and <laughs> applications I'm, i'm not going into detail of the or each topic but exactly we covered we are happy that we covered as per we we promised so these are the various topics we covered and in between also we kept asking the participants to share their feedback interim feedback so that further modification changes or any anything uh, suggested by the participants we we try to incorporate we kept on asking and also those feedback we received we incorporated those feedback i am thankful to all the faculty members who who contributed for it primarily professor <coughs> david harvey sir uh, for accepting our invitation and contributing rather than pr even prior to contributing submitting this proposal so proposal was made by no uh, parcel it was by professor david harvey the course content and then how are we going to go about the program so this was submitted to gyan iit karakpur and we we received the permission to organize this program so from very beginning 2019 we started this process and from that point onward we are in continuously touch with you uh, professor harvey sir and five days interaction was excellent you you interacted with all the participant including me lot of learning experience we had and the way you interacted the uh, you know it was very very familiarized a uh, uh, no, lot of we felt like as if we are member of family while interacting with you so that's a great thing the gesture the way you delivered the lecture uh, we we lot of appreciation for it i'm thankful to 
uh, my colleague, Professor Rajiv Tripathi, sir, uh, for his lecture. Uh, two, two lectures he has delivered. Today also we had a, a lecture by him in a different mode. So we, we keep trying uh, you know, different way of delivering talk. And then also we try to evaluate which way was more effective. So that way, I'll, I'll be coming back to all the participants once again to ask their feedback, seek their input on which mode of teaching is better. Further, uh, I'm, I'm thankful to other colleagues who presented or who delivered lecture, uh, Dr. Yogendra Prajapati and Dr. Sweta Tripathi. Both of them are colleagues in the Electronics Engineering Department of MNNIT, Mutilal Nehru National Institute of Technology, Allahabad. Uh, thank you very much. These are the few pictures I have kept it to show you that on day one we, we took captured few of the pictures. Hopefully you can recognize who the people present here. Uh, one more clipping. Further more clippings are there. Uh, we are going to create a bundle of it and then share with all the participants. Regarding the mark sheet, today you have appeared for the examination. Three things we are going to include into uh, while calculating the total marks obtained. So those three things are your class performance, how you are interacting, how you are attending the classes. Based on that, we are going to assign around 20 marks out, out of 20. 20 is the maximum marks out of 20 marks and marks you are going to get on the basis of your class performance. Second thing is the assignment. All of you have most uh, you, you got an assignment on day three and you have submitted a response of the assignment. Based on that, we are going to maximum marks uh, for the assignment is 20. And today we had 30 questions. Each question had two points and no negative marking. So 60 marks uh, objective five question was, uh, no, we, we conducted the examination. So altogether 100 and then out of 100, whatever marks you will receive based on that, we are going to give you a grade. So grade certificate will be prepared and then it will be posted. And similar to grade certificate, we are also going to prepare a participation certificate. These two things we will be sending you by post. Those who are in the city, <coughs> Prayagraj and or in the institution, if they feel like collecting in person, they, they can collect the certificate, but not ne next week we are planning to distribute. Next week means next week is going to be uh, some vacation and then uh, whenever we are reopening, uh, it is 21st of March. OK, so by 21st of March, your mark sheets and certificate are going to be ready with us. We will start dispatching on 21st of March and those who are present in the campus or uh, can afford to come uh, personally to collect it, they can come and collect on 21st of March. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm thankful to all the team members who have supported me during this uh, five days program, Gyan program, not only five days, but so almost since the starting, okay. So we can see we submitted proposal and then a lot of administrative effort has gone into it. So some are continuously interacting with all of you, including the uh, uh, the resource person. But at the back end, we have a team of people, Mr. Vikas, Mr. Manis, and Amrin Dubey has also been uh, continuously has, uh, supporting me in in terms of providing the infrastructure, internet connectivity, the recording, editing, now a lot of work involved in editing those videos and then making it available on NDL, that is National Digital Library and Gyan Portal. So soon we are going to do it. Again, we'll be taking a week time to do it, but uh, it will be made available for all of you for the benefit of learning. This program is also available on YouTube channel that we have already mentioned. I, I just take this opportunity to talk about my as co local coordinator Gyan. Uh, I take this up, um, opportunity to talk about the upcoming program. So soon we are going to have a program by uh, on blockchain for business. Again, computer science, uh, one colleague from computer science uh, department and myself are going to uh, coordinate this program. So this program is on blockchain for business and foreign faculty is the AKM Nazmul Islam. He is a professor for the digital transformation and with the Department of Software Engineering, LUT University, Finland. 
So he is a good professor. We have interacted many times. So uh, and then he is authority in the area of blockchain. So those who uh, find it interesting, I I recommend that uh, they they can plan it to uh, plan to join this program. So this program is going to start on uh, 28th of I, I think it is 26th of March. Uh, we are going to start 26th to 26th we have revised the date so it is it was not updated so we are starting the program on 26th of march and it will continue till 31st march okay so again five days program so <clears throat> with this uh, you know I'm, I'm thankful to samya and uh, i pass him to samya for the next proceedings thank you very much everyone thank you so much sir thank you for the brief proceedings of the program now i request to professor rajit tripathi sir coordinator of this program no, 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 hold on hold on so we we need to request uh, participant to share their feedback okay okay i hope this gyan program has added a few memories and knowledge to our lives and understanding so we would like to know how well we have efforts resonated to you i request among the participant to give us their feedback and uh, please uh, i request them to switch on their camera while uh, giving their feedback so that we can capture that participants anyone if you would like to share some negative feedback also will be more happy with the negative feedback so that we'll get an opportunity to improve ourselves Yes, you need to unmute uh, Shikhar Jaiswal. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Good uh, evening. My uh, honourable uh, the dignitaries, uh, I would like like to say that this program is really an eye opening for me. Uh, I was finding the application of nanotechnology in electronics that I was not getting. Uh, a very brief overview as sir has already told uh, tripathi sir ki uh, this would be a thing uh, which can start with the uh, knowledge towards it couldn't be expertise but uh, one way or other as professor harve sir has given a digital uh, communication we were we are not from the background uh, the electronics and digital we are from physics but uh, the atomic scale programming and uh, the effects which the next quantum would be working on that would be highly uh, known by this way of applications and these courses that uh, would that are going to help people for our for us to update our knowledge and enhance our uh, field expertise thank you very much thank you very much lot of appreciation thank you very much thank you any other uh, honorable participants would you like to share your views Dr. Renu Gupta, would you like to say something? Oh yes, sir. Uh, my yes, camera sir. is not working, so I'll not be able okay. to switch on my camera. Uh, okay, all right. Yeah, uh, as far as uh, from this FTP, I have gained a lot, and I was not knowing about the nanotechnology, but from this. Uh, I think I came to know about the basics, little bit of about uh, nanotechnology, and its application in various fields. Even I have seen that it can be applied in medical. And as far as I'm from the image processing in medical field only, so it gained me a lot. And thank you so much for this uh, workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing your views. Uh, anybody else would like to share something? Tripurari Sharan, uh, if I'm audible to you, would you like to share something? You are a faculty with nearest uh, Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, yes, sir. This uh, Gyan program, ANFE 2022, was very informative uh, to the students. Uh, and we also enjoyed uh, all the sessions of uh, this five days program. And it was uh, nicely present, presented and organized. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tripurari. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, we need to save some time so that quickly, if someone would like to say something. 
somebody unmuted uh, would you like to say something dr krishna kumar uh, would you like to say something am i audible to you dr krishna yeah uh, good evening sir and uh, first of all uh, i'm thankful to the organizer professor sahu and professor tripathi sir and the experts particularly the phone expert uh, who has taken so many lectures continuously and uh, what i'm looking at since we are in the field of networking now we have started to get the knowledge of nanotechnology and which is um, highly beneficial for the uh, coming networks like 6g and other type of future networks so it was a interesting course and it helps uh, to the participants to enhance their knowledge thank you sir thank you very much dr krishna kumar uh, yeah anybody else would like to say something or we, we can proceed with the next agenda yeah so i i think uh, if no one would like to say something uh, some you may proceed with the next agenda thank you so much sir thank you all the participants for your valuable feedback now i request to professor rajiv tripathi sir coordinator of this program to discuss further proceedings and say few words thank you somya for uh, inviting me again to this valedictory session uh my good old friend professor harvey uh old means in time in terms of friendship not old in age so <laughs> professor sahu my other distinguished faculty colleagues who participated in delivering the contents dr shweta dr yogen and all the participants of this program well lot of efforts and uh, time was given before we came on this platform 5 days ago and uh, i am happy that at least something has been communicated which has created interest in the subject and uh, with the kinds of applications of digital circuits and then design then testability etc has been covered by professor harvey uh, now if that functionality is clear uh, you can further narrow it down with the knowledge which has been imparted by uh, dr shweta and yogen in terms of nanotechnology and uh, you can very easily map those concepts those ideas which have been talked about by professor harve and the technology which has been talked about uh, by dr shweta and my other colleagues you can in a better you are in a better position to map it together and uh, a lot of practical things practical slides have been shared by professor harve and uh, that must have created an interest in the subject and uh, as i said in the op on the opening day that one of the basic purpose of uh, this kind of fdp or gyan program is to create an interest because it's not possible to cover all the dimensions uh, in 5 days interaction and that too for 4 uh, hours and uh, definitely the kind of interest which has been generated you will carry it forward you will use those ideas you will use those concepts in your uh, research and future career enjoy it have good networking with the participants have networking with the uh, guest faculty and uh, other faculty members who were here and uh, so can you so that you can take it forward in your organizations and uh, if interest has been developed definitely you will start enjoying working and studying in on this topic so once again i 
congratulate the gyan coordinator of this institute uh, professor gp sahu for very successfully organizing all the gyan programs in the institute and especially i am uh, thankful to him for assisting me for helping me and for motivating me to put the course in the uh, gyan program and uh, once again thanks to professor harvey for accepting my request and uh, coming again on this virtual platform and uh, let us hope that we will meet uh, in a physical mode very soon and uh, as soon as things have started improving and uh, in fact uh, campus activities that has also started and i am sure that participants whenever you get an opportunity please do visit the department see the facilities some of the softwares which have been uh, exposed to you virtually you can uh, do something here and uh, in future also we are available to help you in all your endeavors which you enjoy thank you all and thanks to all the student coordinators including somya and who were all working from the background and uh, yes somya was in front but all many many more they were working in the background with the technical support with all the support of logistics and uh, uh, as has been said about the feedback any system anything any organization uh, any activity always has the scope for improvement so feel free even after that uh, even this uh, concluding session is over feel free to give uh, your constructive feedback by which we can uh, i don't say i don't call it as a negative feedback uh, it's a constructive feedback by which we can further improve the system so once again thank you all and uh, enjoy the weekend enjoy the subject and enjoy your life all the best thank you namaskar thank you sir thank you so much sir it was always a pleasure to listen you and uh, thank uh, i'm really thankful you um, to you i feel honored to now take an opportunity to invite our chief guest of the day and uh, to this session professor david harvey sir foreign faculty to this five day gyan program to give the presidential address over to you sir okay so possibly he has gone for something yeah he's back you are back yeah please unmute so oh, sorry somebody came to my door okay <laughs> this 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 is a problem of the virtual mode <laughs> did you want me so to say something it. yeah we, we have requested you requested you for your presidential speech sir uh maybe 2 3 more minutes if you would like to talk about so valedictory remark uh, we requested yes please so, the guest, yeah yeah so well, thank you again uh, professor sahu and somia who've looked after me very well this week i think the course is running on time uh, the content uh, being delivered very well by faculty members including a demonstration which was quite informative and uh, i think it's been a useful exercise for people to get some handle on the nanotechnology topic but others pointed out in some of my lectures it's just for starting point and where you take it nanotechnology is small but you know, it's got a long way to go it's still really in its infancy so hopefully you can take some of the concepts and develop them in your own in your own work and embrace it so thank you again everyone that's attended it's a bit difficult i know to make feedback online so i would like to be present if there's any future activity uh, on your campus and things like the uh, computer aided design it's always nice to do hands on 
So I think it's very good that you've opened up the opportunity for delegates to come onto your campus if they're in the locality or can make a trip to use these types of software. Because most software on the computer design side is quite expensive. It's out of the reach of a lot of people. So it's good that you can offer this facility. I mean, the GIAM program itself is very good. Um, and it's been a long time to develop this one. As you say, it started in 2019 with the idea. And uh, with this uh, pandemic, it's been delayed. And then now, even though we can't travel just yet, we're still able to deliver it. So even though virtual mode probably isn't ideal, we're getting used to it because we've been teaching with virtual mode for a couple of years now. And it was good to see my old friend, but not so old, giving a proper lecture this morning <laughs> to show that you know, these things still exist. Because in my own development of the slide, it took me a long time to do some exercises, which I'd be far happier just to draw the circuit on the board. Stage by stage, you can see how it develops. When you've got this PowerPoint delivery, it can become a bit more difficult to get a concept over. So this is why I'm happy to share all my slides. I'll make it available to, to you and uh, people can go through it in their own time. And if they want to, if they can bear my face, they can watch the YouTube video. <laughs> anyway, thank you again, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed the course. I hope it's useful. And I do hope to see you in India before too long. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, sir, looking forward to meet you in person. It was really nice and interactive uh, to hold this five-day program with you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now, further proceeding with the vote of thanks, I would like to first uh, thank God Almighty so that we could plan and uh, pro uh, plan this program and do this program well. Next, Ministry of Education and IIT Kharagpur for providing fund and support uh, regarding the program. Next, I would like to thank Institute for providing valid infrastructure and administrative support to help this program. I would also like to thank Professor R.S. Burma, sir, Director, MNLIT, for facilitating and providing administrative support and encouragement for this program. Last but not the least, I would also like to thank all the dignitaries uh, during this session and all the sessions we had, inaugural session, validatory session as of today. So Professor David Harvey, sir, he took lectures uh, very consistently and patiently and uh, providing us a very knowledgeable lectures. Thank you so much, sir. Professor Rajiv Tripathi, sir, uh, as well as Professor uh, Sahu, sir, who managed this program well. And I would also like to thank all the faculty members who took time to give their valuable lectures on this five days uh, workshop. Dr. Yogendra Prajapati, sir, Dr. Sweta Tripathi, ma'am, M uh, Mr. Manoj Kumar Yadav, sir. La uh, all the, I would like to thank all the faculty members or those who have provided the lectures. Last but not the least, the most important of all, the participants who took uh, all their time patiently and listening all the faculty members to uh, this program. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Over to you, sir. Sahu, sir. Yeah. So we, we now conclude. Thank you very much. Uh, and we are done with five five days program and we are still open next few days or few months we are going to be in going to be available maybe for a lifetime we are going to interact keep interacting with us uh, all the participants it's an opportunity or network that i mentioned that network to be created peer network then peer to superior or uh, faculty colleagues those who are interacted and then institute to institute network also need to be established thank you very much enjoy your weekend and Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your weekend. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And same to you, Dave. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So now I sign off with uh, permission of Professor Rajiv, sir, and others. Thank you. <laughs>